Good evening, constant reader. Tonight, we will be playing our favorite game, Kingo. This is a lot like bingo, except instead of drawing numbers, we read and react to a new Stephen King story. At least it's brand new to me. And we keep an eye out for commonly used tropes from Stephen King's writing. Thanks to the book club's suggestions, we've updated our Kingo card. And if we can fill in five squares in a row, vertically or horizontally or diagonally, we win the Kingo game. And you can play along with your own randomly generated Kingo card. There's a link below in the description. Tonight, I will be reading and reacting to the new Stephen King story, Red Screen. I have no idea what this story is about, so keep in mind I will be stopping and starting the narration to provide my own expectations and reactions. So, if you haven't yet read this story, and you'd prefer to listen without interruptions or Kingo commentary, you can download your own audio production of You Like It Darker, available at audible.com, narrated by Will Patton. But if you are ready to listen and to play some Kingo and celebrate a new tale, then get your Kingo card ready, and together let's experience Red Screen, written by Stephen King. Red Screen by Stephen King Wilson is having a bad morning. He cuts himself shaving and is using a Kleenex to clean away a rill of blood on his chin when Sandy pops her head in to admonish him about leaving the toilet seat up and the cap off the toothpaste. He spills juice on his tie and has to change it. Before he can escape to work, there are several more admonishments. She found beer bottles in the trash instead of the recycling, and he forgot to rinse his ice cream bowl before putting it in the dishwasher. There's another one, but it goes in one ear and out the other without catching on anything in between. Kind of a bummer, all in all. Has he become forgetful and a little slipshod lately, or has she gotten more prickly in the last six or eight months? He doesn't know, and it's too early for such questions. Yet once in the car and backing down the driveway, he has an idea that elevates his mood. If there's such a thing as bad karma, he may have front-loaded his for the day, and from here on, clear sailing, he exclaims, and treats himself to a cigarette out of the pack in the glove compartment. This optimistic idea holds for 15 minutes. Then he gets a call, redirecting him to 34th Avenue in Queens. He is told to see the officers, which is never good karma. Five hours later, when he should be thinking about lunch, Wilson is instead looking through one-way glass into a small interview room. There's a table and two chairs, in one of the chairs sits a man named Leonard Crocker. He's handcuffed to a ring bolt on his side of the table. He's wearing a strap-style undershirt on top of khaki work pants. His outer shirt is now in a tagged plastic bag and bound for forensics. When its turn comes, it will be a while because there's always a backlog, the blood stains on it will be typed and DNA matched. This is a formality. Crocker has already confessed to the murder. Soon, his undershirt and khakis will be swapped for jailhouse tans. Wilson puts on his ID lanyard. When he goes into the room, he puts on a smile. Hi, Mr. Crocker. Remember me? Leonard Crocker seems perfectly at ease, handcuffs and all. You're the detective. Right, Wilson sits down. Do you answer to Lynn, Lenny, or Leonard? 
Lenny, mostly. That's what the guys down at the plumbing shop call me. Lenny it is, then. All right, that is the first page and a half, and we can fill in our first Kingo square right in the middle because Stephen King has used parenthesis in the sentence, when its turn comes, it will be a while because there's always a backlog. The blood stains on it will be typed and DNA matched. And it looks like we might have another police procedure thriller type story from Stephen King. It feels like ever since Mr. Mercedes, Stephen King has been creating a lot more stories that are related to police officers and or private investigators like Holly Gibney. When he does this, sometimes he creates a story that's very realistic, down to earth, a straightforward police thriller, the way Mr. Mercedes is. But sometimes he mixes in the supernatural, as in The Outsider. So let's see what happens in this story. Lenny it is, then. What we're having here, if you agree, is just sort of a preliminary conversation. You were given your rights, correct? Lenny smiles, as a man does when seen through a trick question. First by the officers at the scene, then by you. I called them, you know, the officers. Great. Just to recap, anything you say can be used against me. Wilson's smile widens into a grin. Bingo. What about legal representation? How's your memory on that? Because we're being recorded, you know. I can have my lawyer at any time. If I can't afford one, you'll get me one. It's the law. Correct Amundo. So, do you want one? Just say the word. And I can get some lunch, Wilson thinks. I'm happy to talk to you, detective. But I'll need a lawyer at the trial, right? Unless you want to defend yourself, but a man who defends himself... Lenny raises a finger and cocks his head, more the gesture of a scholar than a plumber. Has a fool for a client. Wilson laughs and nods. Give the man a cupid doll. Then he grows more serious, folding his hands under his chin and looking straight at Lenny. Why don't we get right to the point? You killed your wife this morning, didn't you? Stabbed her three times in the stomach after which she bled out. That's what you told the officers, right? And me? Lenny shakes his head. If you'll recall, what I actually said was, I did it. Meaning you killed your wife, Arlene Crocker. She wasn't my wife. Wilson takes his notebook from the inside pocket of his jacket and consults it. Isn't your wife Arlene Crocker? Not today. Not for the last year, he considers. Maybe longer. It's hard to be sure. Are you saying you killed a stranger? One who just happens to look like your wife of nine years? Yes. Lenny is looking at Wilson patiently, his face saying, Eventually you'll get to the right questions, but I'm not going to help you. So, when we type and DNA test the blood on your kitchen floor and all over your shirt... It won't match that of the deceased woman? Oh, it probably will, Lenny gives a judicious nod. I'm almost sure it will, although I hope your science people will look for particular... Mm, he searches for the right word. Particular components. I don't think you'll find any, but it would be wise to check. I expect to go to jail for killing that thing, but I'd certainly prefer not to. Now Wilson understands. Crocker has already got an insanity plea on his radar. What are you telling me, Lenny? That your wife was possessed? Help me understand. Lenny thinks it over. I don't think you'd call it that exactly. When a person is possessed, correct me if I'm wrong, detective, a spirit or maybe a demon comes in and takes over, but that person is still there inside, being held prisoner. Is that your understanding? Wilson has seen The Exorcist and a couple of similar movies, so he nods. Pretty much. But that isn't what happened to your wife? No. She died when it came in. They all do. They all? Who all? Not many so far, compared to the population of the Earth, which is now 8 billion. You can Google it, but there's more of them all the time. They take over, detective. It's the perfect disguise. We're the perfect disguise. Wilson pretends to think this over. 
What he's really thinking is this interview will be useless to the district attorney. There's going to be plenty of rigmarole ahead. A couple of prosecution psychiatrists, plus Crocker's own shrink. Wilson wouldn't be surprised if Crocker already had one on speed dial. Aliens? Crocker's face says the penny drops. That's right, aliens. I don't know if they come from space or from some parallel world. The websites are pretty much split on that. I think space. It makes sense because, he leans forward, earnest. The speed of light, you know? You know, in the original Kingo card, created by collegehumor.com, it did have aliens. So now I'm sad that I took it out and replaced it with something else. So, so far, we've only got the middle square filled in. I think Crocker is genuine here, so I don't think he is a character that is slowly going insane. Because it's a Stephen King story, and I expect supernatural or weird sci-fi elements, so far I'm assuming that Crocker is telling the truth, but I might be wrong. Let's find out. The speed of light, you know? What about it? Not that Wilson cares. He's losing interest. What interests him is a ham and turkey club from the deli down the street and a Marlboro chaser. Spaceships can't exceed it, or they go backwards in time, or maybe just disintegrate. That's the science. But pure mind, detective, that can make the jump. Only once they get here, they need bodies. We'd probably die without them. We're in the preliminary stage of the invasion now. But if the world governments don't wise up, they'll be coming in thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions. Crocker has been leaning forward over his cuffed and chained hands, but now he sits back. It's all on the internet. I bet it is, Lenny. I bet Kamala Harris is one of those invaders just waiting for Amtrak Joe to croak so she can get her hands on the levels of power. He gets up. I think you need to go back to your cell and think this over before you get arraigned. And, just my advice, I think you need a good lawyer because only a good one could sell that to a jury. Sit down, Lenny says quietly. You want to hear this. While I was reading some of this, I just had an expectation in mind as to how this story is going to end. I'm not going to reveal the prediction now in case you haven't read this story, and I might be right or wrong about it, but I will say this. This story is definitely going to circle back to some of the events that happened this morning with Sandy. Sit down, Lenny says quietly. You want to hear this. Wilson looks at his watch and decides to give Leonard Crocker five more minutes, possibly even ten. Maybe he can decide if the man is really crazy or trying to play him. He should be able to do that. He's a detective, after all. Five or six years ago, someone figured out what's going on. It's on the dark web, detective, and spreading up from there, like ink in water. I'm sure it is. Wilson is no longer smiling. Along with blood-drinking Democrats, Clorox enemas to cure COVID, animal crush videos, and kitty porn. You killed your wife, Lenny. You need to cut the shit and think about that a little. You stabbed her with a butcher knife and watched her die. They change. They become short-tempered and critical. They're not content with just being here. They want to dominate. But we have a chance because some computer wizard figured out a way to detect them. If we survive, there'll be a statue of him in every country all over the world. The aliens trigger a deep command, okay? Automatic. Foolproof. Only a few know about it now, but the information is spreading. That's what the internet's good for. Spreading information. (laughs) Not to mention mental illness, Wilson thinks. It's gonna be a race. Lenny's eyes are wide. A race against time. Whoa, rewind, okay? You killed your wife because she got short-tempered and critical? Hmm, that reminds me of someone from the beginning of the story. Lenny smiles. Don't be dense, detective. Many women nag. I know that. So do men. It's easy to dismiss the preliminary indications. He spreads his hands as far as the cuffs will allow which isn't very far. Wilson says, I think that married to you, Arlene had a lot to be short-tempered and critical about. She started picking, 
Lenny says, picking and picking and picking. At first I felt depressed. Old self-image took a hit, did it? Then I became suspicious. My own wife does some picking, Wilson says. Likes to tell me my car is a traveling pig pen. Gets pissy if I forget to put down the toilet seat. But I'm a long way from using a butcher knife on her. I got the red screen. It's only for a second or two, so they won't see. But when I saw it, I knew. What I know is this interview is over. Wilson turns to the mirror on the wall to his left and runs the side of his hand across his throat. Cut it. It's subtle, Lenny says. He's giving Wilson a look that's both pitying and superior. Like that story about how you boil a frog by turning up the heat very slowly. They take from you. They take your self-respect. And when you're weak, he jerks his hand upward to the length of the chain and makes a choking gesture. They take your life. Women, right? Women or men. It's not a sexist thing. Don't get that idea. Not the exorcist, but the invasion of the body snatchers. The wife killer breaks into a wide grin. Exactly. You stick to that, Lenny. See how it works for you. I think I can talk more openly about my prediction now because Stephen King has really opened it up with these last paragraphs. Lenny has killed his wife who was nagging and controlling and got some kind of red screen. And Wilson also talked about how he has a wife who tells him what to do and is sometimes critical. So the light bulb moment that went off for me is that I thought like, oh, something's going to happen. The red screen is going to appear for Wilson. And then he is either going to suspect that his wife is an alien body snatched creature, or he's going to find maybe even more concrete evidence that his wife is actually an alien. It might be a little bit of a predictable ending if Wilson just ends up repeating the same kind of killing that Lenny has done. So I think I would like an ending. If this is going in that direction, I think I'd kind of like an ending where he finds out that, yes, his wife is a body-snatched alien, but he's like, well, you know, for better or for worse, and then just goes back to eating dinner and watching Netflix. The story continues. Wilson gets home at quarter of seven. Sandy's in the living room watching the evening news. One place is set at the kitchen table. It looks lonely. Hey, babe, he calls. Your dinner's in the oven. The chicken's probably dried out. You said you'd be home by five. Things came up. They always do for you. Did he tell Sandy he'd be home by five? Wilson honestly can't remember. But he remembers Crocker probably now cooling his heels in metropolitan detention, saying, it's subtle. He gets chicken and potatoes out of the oven and green beans out of the steamer on the stove. He thinks the potatoes will be okay, but the chicken and beans look elderly and unappetizing. Did you pick up the dry cleaning? He pauses, a slice of chicken breast half cut, half sawn, actually. What dry cleaning? She gets up and stands in the doorway. Our dry cleaning? I told you last night, Frank. Jesus! I, his phone rings. He pulls it off his belt and looks at the screen. If the call was from his partner, he would decline, but it's not. It's from Captain Alvarez. I have to take this. Of course you do, she says, and turns back to the living room so as not to miss the latest coronavirus death count. Honest to God. He thinks of going after her, trying to smooth this over, but it's his boss, so he pushes accept. He listens to what Alvarez has to say, then sits down. Are you shitting me? How? His voice brings Sandy back into the doorway, his slumped posture, phone to ear, head bent, one forearm resting on his thigh, brings her to the table. Wilson listens some more, then hangs up. He takes his plate to the sink and dumps everything into the garbage disposer. The perfect fucking ending to the perfect fucking day. What happened? Sandy puts a hand on his arm. Her touch is light, but very welcome to him. We had a guy in custody who killed his wife. I was at the scene, a real mess. Blood all over the kitchen, her lying in it. 
Back at the station, I did the preliminary interrogation. The doer was crazy as a loon. He claimed she was an alien, part of an invasion force. Oh my god. He killed himself. They were doing intake at Met Debt. He picked up a pencil, snapped the chain it was on, and stabbed himself in the jugular vein. Alvarez says maybe it was dumb luck, but the intake sergeant says it looked like he knew right where to put it. Maybe he had medical training? Sandy, he was a plumber. That makes her laugh, which makes Wilson laugh. He puts his forehead against hers. And wouldn't you know it, folks, our new Kingo Square that says childhood bully replaced an older Kingo Square that was for any mention of characters that laugh uproariously about things that aren't funny, and I think we would have filled in that square. It's not funny, Sandy says, but the way you said it was, plumber, she laughs again. He fought them, Alvarez said. All the time, the blood was pumping out, spurting out. He fought them. When he passed out, they got him to Presbyterian, but it was too late. He'd lost too much blood. Turn off the TV for me, Sandy says. I'll scramble you some eggs. And bacon? Bad for your cholesterol. But tonight? Okay. Well, Sandy seems nice and not an alien. I wonder what's going to happen. We've only got a couple pages left. We are not going to get a Kingo on this one. They make love that night for the first time in weeks? No, longer. A month at least. It's good. When it's over, Sandy says, Are you still smoking? He thinks about lying. He thinks about the now deceased plumber saying she started picking. Picking and picking and picking. He thinks about how nice this evening was. How different from the last six or eight months. They change, Lenny said. They become short-tempered and critical. He doesn't lie. He says he still smokes, but not much. Half a pack a day at most. Expecting her to say, even that can kill you. She doesn't. She says, have you got any handy? If you do, give me one, please. You haven't smoked in. There's something I need to tell you. I'd been putting it off. Oh, God, Wilson thinks. He turns on his bedside lamp. His keys, wallet, phone, and a little change are scattered across the top of the table. He's put his service weapon in the drawer. He always does. Behind it is a pack of Marlboros and a Bic lighter. He gives her one, thinking, after all these years without, a single puff will probably knock her flat. Take one for yourself. I don't have an ashtray. When I want one, I usually go in the guest bedroom. We'll use my water glass. I'm really interested to find out what she has to say. He lights her up, then his own. Smoking in bed, like when they were first married and thought they'd have a couple of kids and live happily ever after. Twelve years later, there are no kids, and Wilson is feeling mighty mortal. You're not going to tell me you want a divorce, are you? He's joking. He's not joking. No. I want to tell you why I've been so fucking grumpy and hard to live with since this spring. Okay. She puffs her cigarette, but doesn't inhale. I've been wobbling. I don't know what that means, Sandy. It means I'm going into menopause, Frank. Pretty soon it'll be menostop. Are you sure? She gives him a sour look, but then snorts a laugh. I think I'd know, don't you? Babe, you're only 39. In my family, we start early and end early. My sister Pat went into the change when she was 36. My emotions have been all over the place, as you may have noticed. Why didn't you tell me? Because then I'd have to admit it to myself, she sighs. My last period was four months ago, and since then just spotting, like the last few drops from a faucet when you turn it off. A tear rolls down her cheek, just the one. She drops the half-smoked cigarette into the water glass and covers her eyes with one hand. I feel dry, Frankie, old and used up and unlovable. I've been a bitch to you, and I'm sorry. He douses his own cigarette. He puts the glass 
on his night table and takes her in his arms. I love you, Sandy. Always have, always will. Thank you, sweetheart. She reaches past him, her breast pressing his cheek, and turns out the light. For a moment, no more than a second, the screen of his cell phone flashes red. In the dark, Sandy Wilson smiles. The end. Okay, I was really intrigued. I thought that this was going to end with just her talking about menopause, and I wasn't sure exactly how to process that, if that was going to be the case, but nope, it seems like we get the little clue at the end with the red screen flashing and Sandy Wilson, a.k.a. Body Snatcher Alien, is uh, is basically convincing her husband that uh, that she's not an alien. Okay, we can fill in this square under the use of parenthesis. Character hears another voice in his or her mind because he is imagining what his wife would say and he is also remembering the words of Lenny. And while we are at it, let's fill in this square for the catchphrase. The phrase picking, picking, picking is used twice. And so for me, that's enough to call it a catchphrase. Recently, a book club member said that I should include cigarettes as a part of drug addiction for our square alcohol and drug addiction. I thought that was an interesting point, and so I've made a slight revision, which means we can fill in this square as well. And you notice in the last few lines, we do get the mention of this phrase, her breast pressing his cheek. This is a newly added square because several of our book club members have pointed out that this seems to be a commonly described body part in the works of Stephen King. So we get to fill in this square. All right, it's time to see how we did on our Kingo card. We only had five spots filled, and I did not get a Kingo. I hope that you did. I didn't get anything in the first row except for characters repeating a catchphrase. The second row, nothing. We had the use of parenthesis. This story took place in New York, so it wasn't Maine. We didn't get a reference to the Red Sox. We did have a civil servant, the detective, but he was not corrupt. There was a wallet mentioned, but it wasn't any of King's specific attire. No song lyrics, no religious zealot, no characters with the initials RF, no kid dying, and there was not a major character as a writer. So, no Kingo, but we did get a fun short story, a little twist on Invasion of the Body Snatchers, with the sort of nagging wife cliche thrown in. Which makes me wonder if this lady from Creepshow was actually an alien. Just call me Billy, everyone does. Sorry, Billy. How could I forget? Well, that's it for our Kingo game and our read-along reaction video. Thank you, as always, for watching and listening to the Stephen King Book Club.